I'm now going to move across here, and presumably something will change here, and invite my amazing panel to step up here, and I will introduce you. So, where's Rui? Rui, Al, Papa, Sarafa, your excellences, I should say. Please, please come and join me, and I will introduce you, and Where then... Where do you want us? Can we just sit around? Oh, please sit wherever you like. You can't escape. <laughs> These two in the middle flew back <laughs> on the same plane from Kigali last week, <laughs> and they've been plotting against me ever since, I think. So I need to be, I need to be very, very careful. And they've probably planted questions. So um, let me start. I'm going to start in the, the middle um, to introduce you, and then I, I suspect you know. Uh, firstly, His Excellency Sarafa Tunji Yasola, Nigeria High Commissioner, uh, for the government of Nigeria. Um, Sarafa was um, former Minister of Mines and Steel Development um, and has been uh, an astute politician in the national and international um, party since. Um, he was chairman of the Abiyokuta North Local Government, a position he held in the 90s, and during the same period he was elected chairman, conference of local government council chairman in Ogun State and his outstanding leadership qualities singled him out for higher political responsibilities, and he's now here. I first met Your Excellency at a party where my other friend Hippapa was at to celebrate the presentation of his credentials to, uh, to the, Her Majesty the Queen. It also happened to be his birthday. Um, it was a very long party and a very big birthday cake, and we all had great fun, and we've been friends ever since. <laughs> so welcome, welcome, Your Excellency. Um, sitting next in the middle here, we have His Excellency Papa, Papa Owusu Ankoma, who is currently, and has been for a while now, Ghana's High Commissioner to the UK, having been appointed in June 2017. Um, Papa is a senior Ghanaian political figure. He was a founding member of the ruling New Patriotic Party. He's a lawyer by profession and was called to the bar in 1981, so he's even older than me. He was a member of the Parliament of Ghana for 20 years, spanning five four-year terms um, from 97 to 2017. And during the, during the Kufuor presidency, he served as a minister in the numerous portfolios, youth and sports, majority leader, parliamentary affairs, attorney general, and justice. Um, he's got extensive knowledge of parliamentary practice, and he's a good friend who constantly tells me to set up in Accra, quite rightly, as, as being a former lawyer, as being a lawyer. Nobody, nobody's ever a former lawyer, I should say. Um, and, and he's got an amazingly talented daughter who's a partner at one of our greatest friends, friendly firms. So, Papa, welcome. Um, the Colonel, Colonel Rui Nelson Gonsalves, who speaks more languages than it's possible to list, he could tell you, he could probably sit here and tell you how many words there are for heart in 20 or 30 different languages, probably, but I won't test him. <laughs> He's, um, no, it's true. He is what's known as a polyglot, I think it's fair to say, as was discovered last night over dinner. He's also a good singer. Um, but in his real work, he's been in the diplomatic community in the UK for nine years now. Um, I don't think anybody probably knows more than him, and if you need to know about him, ask Alex Vines at Chatham House. But he joined the Angolan Armed Forces in 1983 and was trained as an air defense officer and has served in various air defense units um, and held positions in the Air Force until 92 before spending seven years in the Ministry of Defense International Relations Directorate. He has participated in various seminars on preventive diplomacy, conflict resolutions organized by regional and international organizations. And as I say, he's been posted for nine years. This is a lot, a lot, of, a lot of interesting interest there, so we're going to be testing you later, but we won't be singing unless everybody wants to. Um, last and not least, although we'd probably debate that, Al, because Al and I, Al and I co-chair, or until Actually, I think we're still co-chairs. Technically, we are still co-chairs of the UK government's Africa Investors Group, which is a, a, a great organization of um, private sector working with public sector to promote trade with Africa. Al, until very recently, was the acting trade commissioner for Africa, uh, based in Cairo. 
And before this role, he served as uh, Deputy Trade Commissioner, which I think he is returning to brief at the moment. He leads on UK trade and investment promotion across the whole African continent. Um, previously Regional Director for Trade and Investment um, for the Middle East, Afghanistan and Pakistan based in Dubai. Um, as I say, Al and I have got to know each other very well in the last year. Um, he knows Africa really well and cares about it. Um, I've said too much now. Mm -hmm. So welcome to everybody, welcome my panel. They're a really great group. So, so thank you. Um, I'd like to get the applause in before I start asking the questions, just in case. But I want to start with um, just really an open question, maybe with you, Your Excellency Sarafa. Can I call you Sarafa for these purposes? Because yes. if I say Your Excellency, we won't know who's going to answer. So um, protocols observed, mm -hmm. Sarafa. As we move, and same question for everybody, we're hopefully moving towards life after the pandemic, we hope, although judging by the people who missed this today, there's still a bit of it about. Um, can you briefly describe some of the key learnings you and your country, Nigeria, have taken from the pandemic? And what are the main messages you see for the future of Africa? And then maybe Papa after Sarafa. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, shall I say good afternoon to the audience? The challenge of uh, COVID has uh, uh, really taught us some lessons, one of uh, which is uh, the need to be self-sufficiency, particularly in food production, because uh, during the pandemic, the world was uh, more or less in coma. And, uh, so the, 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 the emphasis now is to grow what you eat, and eat what you grow. And that has led to some kind of self-sufficiency in some food crop production in Nigeria, particularly in the area of rice and cassava, which happen to be the two most staple foods in Nigeria. And uh, it has also led to some kind of uh, development technical, technologically. Uh, we, now, we now have uh, cassava bread, and uh, cassava is being used in various forms. And uh, some of the cassava uh, uh, produced in Nigeria are also still being exported uh, to places like uh, Europe. Uh, they serve as uh, good feeds for pigs and uh, some other uh, animal husbandry. So in addition to that, we also discovered that uh, the issue of alternative medicine has been developed uh, in Nigeria. Um, up to now, it's still an irony, but it's the truth, uh, given the fact that uh, for, it, for 206 million population of Nigeria, we only lost about 3,000 on account of COVID. So um, there's still even self-denial to a reasonable extent in, in Nigeria today, whether COVID is real or not. COVID has been described as a, a variant of malaria it's always difficult to say this outside, but that, that is the truth. Um, because uh, the, 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 there are even some, some of our alternative medicine producers that offer to come to Europe uh, with various herbs to ensure that uh, um, um, they provide prophylactic uh, uh, treatment for, for COVID. So um, in the process, a lot of uh, our institutions, including hospitals, developed various prophylactic treatments for COVID. Uh, as I'm talking to you, I have the opportunity of uh, making sure that uh, uh, I boost my immunity, both uh, using both Nigerian remedy and, uh, and the orthodox remedy. In the morning, I always have the Nigerian remedy, and they're very simple. I take my uh, cloves, uh, ginger, turmeric, and, uh, uh, and garlic in the morning during breakfast. And uh, in the afternoon, I take my vitamin D, zinc, mm -hmm. uh, vitamin C. And, uh, uh, you know, so that's what I take every day. Uh, altogether, I've, I've taken 43 COVID tests, and I've always been negative. So these are the kind of things that really evolve within the system, 
we call it uh, Nigeria prophylactic development uh, in the treatment of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the, the challenges. Now on the issue of, uh, of trade, one of the challenges that we have in Africa, and Nigeria without exception, is lack of uh, vaccines. The vaccination rate is very low. In Nigeria, with our 206 million, uh, I think we have about 3 million. So, like there's a Nigerian language which said, necessity is the mother of invention. invention. But given the lack of access to vaccines, uh, the, I mean, the, our population has to develop alternative to, its, uh, to strengthen the immunity. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really worked for us. So, COVID has really made Nigeria to look inward in many perspectives. And some of these uh, developments will come to affect our, our ways of life. The, in addition, we discovered that in Nigeria, a lot, I mean, a lot of our economy is largely based on imports. We export oil, which is our mainstay of any foreign exchange, and we almost 70 or 80 percent of uh, the earnings is also, also used to import uh, things from Nigeria. So, uh, emphasis now being placed on self-sufficiency in producing what, in consuming what we produce. So those are the lessons okay. that we have learned. From. Well, I hope we've all been making a note. It's the turmeric which I brought in particularly. Papa, thank well, you. Uh, thank Papa. you very much, and uh, it's a good afternoon to you all, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and say, commend uh, Andrew. Well, for the good work you're doing, your interest you. in Africa, <laughs> and of course, uh, being recognized by Her Majesty the Queen for your interest in trade in Africa. Then. Well, I must say that uh, for Ghana, we've also learned lessons. Of course, I, I learned a personal lesson, which is uh, two years ago, I nearly died. I had COVID here, yeah. two weeks on the ventilator. I'm not too sure whether at that time, whether the local remedy would have survived. Would have, oh, oh, yes. <laughs> but back home, when I went to Ghana late 2020, I just got to know that at the peak of this COVID, when PPEs were difficult to come by and it was so expensive, you know, there was some innovation in Ghana. They were doing their own face masks with cloth. And the head of the Food and the Food and Drugs Authority said probably it was the first globally accredited face mask in cloth. And all the sanitizers and other things were produced locally. And so we got to know that, look, when in critical times, probably it is better to innovate. And of course, we didn't have the uh, vaccines, we had vaccine nationalism. And so we decided that no, we needed to set up a vaccine manufacturing facility. And uh, together with Rwanda and Senegal, etc., just last week, the president of Rwanda and uh, the president of Ghana joined me, cut the sword for a vaccine plant in Kigali. Of course, there was also an MOU signed between the Ghana Food and Drugs Authority, which is supposed to be on uh, level three, whatever they call it, in terms of uh, who assessment of uh, Drug and Food Authorities, you know, collaborating with the Rwandan Drug Authority. So first, innovation, and then looking inwardly in Africa through collaboration to see how we can work together. And of course, the greatest lesson, and uh, my brother Sarah has mentioned that Probably the time has come for us to look inwardly. Of course, for food production, 
the government had put in place a program of uh, what they call grow, grow food for jobs, etc., etc. So, in terms of the global food chain, uh, we are not that adversely affected. Do not eat too much imported rice or whatever, but was self-sufficient. So for us, one, to prepare for the next wave of disaster where everyone looks to their own, we need, as a matter of urgency, to innovate and manufacture things for ourselves. And of course, going forward, it is imperative that for us, as Africa, we work together to find solutions for some of, of our problems. But I dare say that the greatest lesson, too, that we've learned is that <laughs> if anything like COVID hits Africa like it hits Europe, we'll be in trouble. <laughs> That's it. Because okay. we are not prepared for that. So now, let's prepare ourselves for any future pandemic that may hit Africa in particular. COVID, mm, I dare say, it's a European and uh, Asian pandemic. Its effect on Africa was quite comparatively minimal. The scientists have not been able to explain, but it said, said well, we have a relatively youthful population, and then uh, it seems that the virus does not thrive in heat, etc. But these are all uh, not based on any scientific data. So, for me, yeah. that's it. Thank you. Thank you. It's an inter similar, <laughs> you know, when it hits the world, the world looks at itself. <laughs> and so you need to look for yourselves, I guess is what you're saying. Rui, how, how about you? Same question for Angola. Well, <clears throat> sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I think that if there is something that we have to agree with is that COVID-19 has had a very negative impact in all the countries all over the world and Angola obviously is not an exception. And at this stage, I think what we should bear in mind is that it's crucial to transform the, this negative impact of COVID-19 into positive experience and then from there we have to find a way of not just to restore the economy that has been heavily affected by uh, COVID-19 but also to transform that in order to find solutions for uh, uh, moving the country, the country forward. Uh, one uh, of the great experiences that we've had with COVID-19 is definitely the highly dependence that the Angolan economy has on uh, external revenue, depending heavily, basically, on the oil revenues. Hydrocarbons right now uh, count for 96% of our revenues. And obviously, at the time of COVID-19, the oil price just well, they dropped considerably. And it is, as you may imagine, for a country that is heavily dependent, has had a very negative impact. And obviously, at the time, the government was not prepared. I don't even think that there was any government in Africa, just to, not to say all over the world, that was prepared for such, you know, for a disease of such dimension. And especially in the case of Angola, we were coming from you know, just two years after elections, and after elections, the government, the new government, has had very big challenges, especially to tackle corruption. We are, in fact, trying to see whether we could get money to, you know, fix the main problems that we had, and all of a sudden, the government just said, wow, now here we are, we've got this disease, and we have to find a way to resolve that. Another um, great experience that we have, learning experience that we had with the COVID-19 pandemic, 
was that indeed Angola, and I think the all of the continent, all the countries, the 55 countries that we've got, were not prepared in terms of uh, health facilities, infrastructures. It was critical. In the particular case of Angola, most of the population, over 50% of our population, they live in rural areas. And unfortunately, the health care that we've got, the, the, the facilities and the specialized doctors, they are most concentrated in urban areas, especially in Luanda, the capital city. And obviously, the majority of the population, they didn't have access to health care facilities. And this has been a major problem for uh, the government because at that time it was, well, here we are, we have to find a way to make sure that those people living in the rural areas, they've got also access to healthcare. And one of the greatest challenge, apart from this learning experience that we had, for instance, was the fact that, you know, there were this campaign going on talks that, oh, okay, the, the, the vaccines that have been put forward for uh, people to be vaccinated, they are fake vaccine. In fact, it's, there, is a there were a lot of conspiracy theories. You're going to die if you take this vaccine. You're going to do, it. oh, this is something that is being produced in Europe to kill Africans or to kill black people. And these sort of challenges, in fact, made things even worse for the government, but at the end of the day, I think, as we say back home, I think God was there and just blessed it because the continent, in fact, despite the lack of infrastructures, the fact that we were not prepared to like tackle a situation like that, uh, the, the figures that we had uh, contaminated people, even the death toll was not the death toll was not that great if we compared with the rest of the world and uh, at the end of the day well the government managed to uh, uh, tackle the situation and we've if we look at the figures we've had one of the shortest rates of death and even people that have been contaminated mm. and uh, uh, I think I will save it there. Okay, no, that's fine. And it, it sort of it highlighted the issue around mm. oil and things like that. Al, from you, you live in Africa, but you're working with, with the government here. Um, slightly different perspective, I guess, but your, your views from Thank what you. you've seen. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for the invitation to join the panel. And before I answer the question, can I also just join His Excellency in congratulating you, Andrew, on your appointment as an MBE by Her Thank Majesty uh, and say how richly deserved that is from everything we've done together, but all that you've done for the Royal Africa Society, your legal services work. Uh, really, really pleased to see you recognized in that way. Thank you. Um, I would agree with their excellencies that while the economic impact of this pandemic for Africa has been severe, really severe, uh, mercifully, perhaps the health impacts have been less than we might have anticipated, um, but, you said earlier, this is a straight talking session. Uh, it's a source of very great concern that we didn't manage to vaccinate more people in Africa and to provide uh, better healthcare support. Uh, we're still um, very much engaged on that. His Excellency's mentioned some of the initiatives at Chogham that were announced. We've been a part of that too, but across Africa, we're trying to support vaccine manufacture, healthcare uh, support. Um, that really matters because you're right. What about the next pandemic? What's that gonna look like? And will Africa fare as well, mm. if that's the right term as it has this time? And um, one of the things I think we did discover as a UK government service working in Africa is through this pandemic, we forged new relationships. We were thrust together with new people using virtual means often, mm. uh, such that we've been able to develop some new collaborations. So particularly in healthcare, uh, we're, we're doing a lot more, actually, than we were before the pandemic because of the need to respond together. Uh, a lot of our companies have been involved in that as well. So, you know, members of our African Investors Group highly involved in supporting their communities and manufacturing um, uh, sanitizer and those sorts of things. 
but also in things like supply chains and how we support supply chains and keep them open. Lots of new relationships and collaborations forged during the pandemic. The other area I wanted to mention was technology, where I think um, everything Africa has done to embrace technology in recent decades showed during the pandemic as that technology stood up, people were able to connect still, were able to connect across the, the, the globe as well. And those companies we saw in Africa that were ready for digitalization or had already embraced it really flourished. And I think you've seen a further acceleration, therefore, of the adoption of technology and, and the uses of it in Africa and the pioneering uses of it, because um, a lot of our companies say we develop solutions in Africa that we then sell to Europe, not the other way around. And so it's a really proud story, I think, of, uh, of technology in Africa during the pandemic. I'd highlight one particular area where, uh, where I think there was some, a brilliant human impact to that, and that was on education, where through a lot of uh, UK-African collaboration on EdTech, we were able still to reach people with education during that quite extended period. Mm. Mm. Thanks. Um, I think that takes us on probably to the trade question. And I'm going to start with you, Pava, because obviously the AFTCA Secretariat is based very happily in Accra with Mam Kalimeni running it. Um, as the Africa continental free trade area takes effect, um, what do you see as the main benefits of this in the context of what you've just said, actually? Yeah. And also, how's it going? Is it going to be motoring forward, or how's it going? Well, uh, as is usual with things of such nature, the pace is not as fast as we would wish. but. For Africa, AFTA is a game changer. I mean, you're going to have the largest market with a burgeoning youthful population. So I am looking forward to AFTA, if it becomes fully operational, to get Africa as probably the biggest hub for manufacturing and even innovation. Because you're going to have improvement in supply chains. With AFTA, I am certain that, look, it will be a boost and a benefit to the whole world. I mean, when you have a large market, you have a youthful population and a burgeoning middle class. That is really a game changer. So we are very, very, very optimistic. We're saying that even in the UK, if you want to expand your trade relations, you need to take advantage of AFTA through joint ventures with African partners, because you're going to have the largest single market ever. And we are working seriously. at least. I mean, almost all the countries have signed up to it, they've ratified it. Now we are taking steps to put the legal regime in place, remove the customs barriers, etc., etc. So for me, after also reinforces the point that this is Africa's century. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is Africa's century. And in terms of global trade development, we have to look at Africa. But of course, a lot depends on us. I mean, uh, African countries must think big. We must, uh, we must not think individual, right? It's better to have one in something which is a million pounds worth than 10 in something which is only 50 pounds worth. So for me, AFTA is a game changer. And one good thing to now about Africa is that you have the youthful population which has a globalized outlook. Unlike uh, probably people in our generation who, who, who are rather insular in the way we think. So 
and the world is now a global village with social media and the internet. So we are also taking advantage of technology with AFTA. So for me, uh, I say that I hope God gives me probably another 20 years. I can assure <laughs> you, Andrew, and uh, <laughs> all of you listening, that you'll be seeing Africa really, 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 really on the move. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, Wam Kelimeni, he, he said when we had lunch with him, he said, you've got to remember, how long did it take you to do the European Union? And it still looks where it is now. So, and Sarafa, maybe Nigeria has, has, you know, being so big and being able to do everything itself, probably. How do you, how, does, how do the Nigerians see Africa? And how do you see Africa going forward? Well, uh, um, after, I mean, that is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Came into effect in January 2021, uh, effectively. Um, the, the treaty itself was signed in 2019, uh, and Nigeria became the 34th member to ratify uh, that agreement. Um, like you rightly know, we, we have our challenges in Africa. The, the major one is uh, intra-Africa trade, as, as at now, is just about 15 percent, you know, and uh, these are largely due to non-tariff barriers. Uh, things like uh, exchange control uh, is good. It's a good thing now that uh, we have set up the Pan-African Payment Settlement System in Ghana to address uh, that challenge. But we must still acknowledge that we have issues like insecurity. We have issues like uh, poor infrastructure. We have challenges in our ports congestion. Uh, power infrastructure is still an issue. So um, as we address all these issues, um, even the UN Economic Commission for Africa suggests that uh, uh, we have the potential to increase Afri African trade by 52.3% if after it's really uh, in full operations. And uh, I know very well that our leaders are committed uh, to these challenges. Um, for example, there's usually uh, a joke to go from Nigeria to uh, probably um, Niger you will have to go through Paris, you know. So those are, those are challenges. Whereas uh, um, where we have infrastructure uh, between Katsina State, which is the border town with Niger, you, you are there within two hours. So all this uh, infrastructure development has not really helped. And they, don't, they are not things that you grow overnight. But I strongly believe that uh, the with the Chinese proverb that you join it to 1,000 miles, always start with the step. Um, with the foreign exchange uh, with, uh, system uh, being put in place, because the, what we call PASS, that is Pan-African Payment uh, Settlement System, which allows you to uh, uh, sell goods in your own currency, and also allow, allow the buyer to buy in his own currency. And uh, a lot of uh, British investors uh, in, uh, in Nigeria and Africa uh, always emphasize the need for, for exchange, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. control mm -hmm. uh, in, in business activities. So that's already been taken care of. Uh, I'm also aware that uh, the issue of uh, insecurity, uh, which is uh, the greatest challenge we have now, particularly in Nigeria, um, a lot of this insecurity are not really within. They came with the fall of Libya, all the and the insecurity in the Sahel region. That is also being addressed because we are talking of movement of goods and services. I'm also aware that uh, in Nigeria, a lot of these checkpoints are being taken off the road with a view to to, to facilitate the movements of goods. Uh, across our borders. Um, so all these um, issues still inhibit 
in the path, I mean, in the, in the operation of uh, the after. But given African GDP of $3.4 trillion, I strongly believe that the potential is great. Mm. And the, we, we have always believed that the, the developed world, particularly Europe and America, should come within the context of partnership. Mm. Uh, we believe that the days of giving aids to African countries should be gone for good because partnership help, help both uh, the, the developed world and the developing world. So you, a lot of uh, the African countries today, they, they still fall into the category of developing or even least developed countries. And we continue to, uh, I mean, to bring it to the knowledge of Europeans and Americans that uh, if Africa is not developed, that is, is, will pose a great security threat to Europe as well. Because in Nigeria alone, 206 million, million population, if you have uh, just 10% of them migrating to Europe, uh, that due to a lot of uh, factors that are prevalent in Africa, hmm. you can imagine uh, what that will tantamount to. Yeah. So with this partnership, it's going to be beneficial uh, well, although I'm aware that in the business world, according to Peter Drucker, the, the main, I mean, the primary objective of business is uh, profit. But we are now living in a globalized world. As much as pro profit is important, the future of humanity is also very important. Uh, in Kigali, I made it a point to one of the SM SMI's initiative of uh, His Royal Highness Prince Charles that the world must move into people expecting government to key into development. Mm -hmm. The world should move into having a kind of tripartite arrangement between government, which is in the public sector, the private sector. Some of these challenges can be turned into businesses. And finally, the civil society organizations who will you know, really assist in this, uh, because we still have challenges in Africa, which we must ad admit, the challenges of transparency, and the conduct of challenges of corruption, and all these, you know, uh, really, really don't help in business development. But when the private sector is involved, all these challenges are greatly reduced. So we strongly believe that this partnership is, is important, and I keep on emph emphasizing in Britain here, <coughs> We don't even mind to be junior partners, but we don't want it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think you've covered almost everything there, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, Al, maybe, because we got a, uh, the UK has a big mission in Accra, especially for Africa. So maybe tell us, how, how do you see <coughs> the UK supporting Africa and why would we support it? So I, I think it is a game changer. Uh, it's not a pipe dream either. I mean, the, the progress it's made is, is absolutely extraordinary these, these last few years under the leadership of His Excellency Wam Kalimane. And um, I think it's the most exciting trade initiative globally at the moment. Um, and I know uh, the Prime Minister who met Wam Kalimane at Chogham feels that way too, actually, mm. that this is, this is the biggest thing out there. Um, and we believe that uh, Africa is the future. It's growing already incredibly rapidly, but real liftoff will come when Africa trades with itself. Mm. And at the moment, what's the figure? 16%, I think. 15%. 15%. Uh, it's going so, down. So, but when that comes up to something comparable to the EU, which is over 60%, just imagine. You know, just imagine the power of that. And uh, that's why we're in it, by the way. Uh, because when Africa is, is trading like that, then Africa is, uh, the whole world wins, you know. And, um, and we, don't, we don't need the aid. We've got the trade doing it all. And um, uh, that is an incredible horizon to be looking forward to. And so we are, we're trying to help in our very modest way. Um, uh, Juan Calimene, I think, would confirm it's a little bit modest at the moment. Um, but we are trying to help. We are th the first nation outside of Africa to sign a cooperation agreement with his secretariat. 
Um, I think the reason for that was because we've done some, some stuff in Africa that he's appreciated and, and would like to uh, bring into his project. Mm. So namely the work we did in East Africa with Trademark East Africa to help uh, with trade facilitation routes which have included uh, exports through the port of Mombasa, the, the, the time that takes coming down from 15 days to three. And what he wants to do is try and employ some of the, I think, in fairness, very simple things that we, we did around that with, with African support. So basically moving non, non-tariff barriers. Yeah, but also uh, the whole collection of, as you look across a trade route, where are the barriers, the obstacles, mm. the but also how are the communities supported by this trade route and how do we make that work so that we incentivize the behaviors that, that move things through mm. and see everybody benefit. And he wants to bring that to other trade corridors in Africa, namely, I think the main one, Lagos Abidjan. Uh, that's his, I think, okay. you know, prize if he, can, if he can help on that. So we're, we're really keen to, to try and support. And then we're also uh, keen to support the individual member states as well, because um, I think, in a way, the greatest barrier, perhaps, that the Africa still faces is, is bringing everybody with it, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's incredibly exciting. Yeah, yeah. And, really, I want to... If you could just comment briefly on that, and then... Because I know that you can tell me how many, but in terms of the private sector, um, and it's something Sir Afa picked up on earlier, the need to use the private sector and innovate. Um, I know Angola is... is pushing really hard on this so maybe something on Africa but then move it a bit towards how how the private sector and privatizations are, are taking root in Angola thank you I will come to that but before just one minute yeah, yeah. quickly on the topic that has been here yeah. has been discussed here I think that in Africa we have still a long way to go with regards to this after which is not something new in fact the concept has been there for quite a while but we still have to look at the barriers that we've got in the continent, mm. 50, 54 countries. Yeah. If we don't learn that together we will prevail and divide will fall, we are not going anywhere. Mm. Listen, today in Africa, if I have to fly from Angola, let's say to any country in East Africa, it's much easier for me to fly to Europe before. Mm -hmm. And then from yeah. there, I will connect to the continent. Just imagine Crazy. that. We, passports, I'm, Angola, for instance, is one of the regional organizations where we are. It's the Southern Africa Development Community. Yeah. 15 countries. If you look at the 15 countries, I mean, the main countries like South Africa, Angola, big countries with the high flux of tourists and everybody. We still need a valid visa to travel to any of those countries. Very few countries, you know, you will fly without uh, requiring a visa. But if you look at the same African countries there, they've got, I mean, for instance, countries in Europe, in Asia, elsewhere in the world, they don't require visa to fly to those countries in Africa. Is that the type of integration that we want? We can't even do a copy-paste. Look at the European Union. Mm. So the country, well, Brexit apart. <laughs> they are moving, <laughs> moving freely in Europe. If I decide to travel today to Belgium or anyone, whatever country in Europe, just take my passport straight to the airport, get a ticket, and I feel like it's fine. But in Africa... You should try moving a container of, lug of furniture to it, Portugal now. To Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's, just saying. Well, in, in a nutshell, in a few words, I think that it's a matter of mindset. We, before we get so excited with this after and there, we have to sit, show the leadership. What is it that we want? What is it required for us to get integrated? I took very quick notes... Imagine, Angola is the second major oil producer in Africa after Nigeria. Mm -hmm. South Africa, the main oil supply is to South Africa. Nigeria, further there, nothing wrong, obviously, further there. In the Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, United States of America, imagine. South Africa is three hours flight from Angola. 
the second major oil producer. How are we going to get there? Mindset, leadership. We have to sit and see this is what we need to get the continent integrated. Our economies must be integrated properly. We must have policies. These things of visa. Really, today, 21st century, we have the same problems that back ago. And then sometimes we just try to find culprits for our own problems. That's what I would want to say. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. I think you've all. Okay. Yeah. But that's what you guys need to do. This is, this is, we have important people on this panel, who, all of who can, can deal with that. Um, I'm not going to ask you all the same question. I mean, Al, Boris Johnson says that he wants the UK to be the partner of choice for African countries. Actually, how are we doing? So, re really quick answer. So the principle behind that is that Africa should judge, yeah. not, not, not exactly. us, how yeah. we're doing in being a partner uh, to them. Um, but we're working really hard to, to deserve that um, acclaim, I hope. Uh, so, for example, uh, UNCTAD has just released its World Investment Report confirming that the UK is the largest investor into Africa now. Um, for my part, our network last year directly assisted with 3.4 billion of UK investment into Africa, the majority of which is renewable energy investments. Uh, and in addition to that, our British international investment committed a further 2 billion. So last year, the British government directly handled over 5 billion of investment directly into Africa. Um, in addition to which, I think our investors uh, across Africa, the, the big names you know, ABF, um, Diageo, Unilever, GSK, I would, I don't know for a fact, but I would warrant that they're the largest, collectively we're then the largest payers of tax revenues on the continent, possibly the largest foreign uh, producer of jobs as well. I mean, these, these are things I'd, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at because I think we, we're doing that. But the, that to one side, because that's again not really what this is about, it's about what His Excellency was talking about earlier. It's about impact, uh, not profit. Um, and deserving to be a partner to grow because we're supporting Africa with what it wants, what it needs, and doing it in a way that is inclusive, sustainable, and having the impact for the world, and, 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 um, and uh, having Africa be a leader in the, in the future world economy. And that's, hope, you know, and, and, and it is a mutual thing, because if Africa gets there with us at its side, then we grow just as Africa grows, just as Africa becomes this huge trading block. Mm. Uh, as Africa succeeds with all the potential it has, the UK is alongside that. Yeah. That's so, manifestly so, yeah. good. Yeah. So, Sarafa, I know you have. I've heard you express views on this. I'm, I'm just going to. How? What do we need to do better? Well, uh, July last year, precisely. Uh, I remember we had the opportunity of having a bilateral with uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, my president. Um, and uh, there, uh, the challenge that uh, Britain is, the fifth, is currently the fifth largest investor in Nigeria uh, after India, uh, US, China, and uh, one other country. Uh, and yes, even Netherlands investment currently in Nigeria currently it is higher than Britain. And uh, if it was disturbed and even said it's not possible, but one of the eight around there confirmed it. Mm -hmm. And we strongly believe that uh, this expected global Britain after Brexit should focus on Africa. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, well, if it will not focus on Africa, is it the US market? The U U.S. is more of a closed economy, uh, almost producing whatever they need. Are we going to go to China, you know, or is it Australia? So obviously, it's Africa. And uh, some of these uh, challenges, I strongly believe, uh, can't be addressed. It just needs commitment on the part of uh, everybody. COVID has taught us one lesson. 
no one is safe if the world is not safe. Mm. The, uh, it is along this line that I strongly believe, and I continue to retreat, that we are no more looking for AIDS. The days of AIDS are gone. Even we must admit some of the AIDS to even still come back to the various donors through corruption and other things. So now we need to move into areas of partnership and collaboration, which will be beneficial more to the people. And I keep on emphasizing, since the assumption of office here uh, as the High Commissioner, that I look forward to more of people-to-people -people relationship. Things are beneficial to people. And to move away from this government-to-government -government relationship, which always end up mostly on MOUs gathering uh, <laughs> dust in the shelves. <laughs> and that's why I have been emphasizing that please That's the, Ni that's the Nigerian EDF for you. <laughs> that, 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 that's, you know, okay, please no. involve the private, private sector. There's transparency, there's efficiency. There's, you know, the goals of the private sector is such that things will be done in better. So government must now see it as a duty uh, to be the driver, but the operators should be the private sector. That, I think, with that paradigm shift, we'll be able to make more progress than all these uh, rituals of clicking the camera for political, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> mileage of uh, signing memorandum of understanding, which uh, by the time one government goes, the bureaucrats are not involved. After one so the, government. So the private sector. Yes, please. Fantastic. And so, but I did ask you, Rui, about the privatization in Angola, and you talked about it's other things. So tell me about privatization. We're get, I'm going to finish when I want to in a minute. Very quickly, <laughs> very quickly on that. There is, um, the country has got a privatization program that was set up in 2018. Yeah, with 180? Uh, and what, whatever. Lots, Hundred, of lots of companies. Well, you know that our economy before it was just a concentrated yeah, state yeah. want yes. companies, mm. which someone said hell in the panel, I think our colleague from Rwanda that it's something that we have to forget about because it won't take us anywhere. And so the government came with this program, 2018, just after the election. So we need to privatize and also to empower the, the, the private sector. Uh, I mean, encourage people to, to take on business and give them you know, the tools so that they can then boost the economy. As of January 2022, this year that we are speaking, the government has raised 1.6 billion US dollars out of 73 assets that were sold okay. out, privatized, which is not bad, I think. Well, it's a long way to go. It's yeah. a road that, you know, we have to make. But we are getting there because a few couple of years ago, it was just impossible. <laughs> Because, yeah, yeah. no, we have got, it's, an, it's something that we inherited from the past. No, let's keep it with the government. It's better that the government takes care of this. And we have realized that that's not the way we should go forward. The program is going but it's on. it's progressing well. It's progressing very it's well. I'm, it's what I'm hearing. And yeah. we are getting there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Conscious of time, which I always say, I'm, I'm going to ask you just a final question for everybody. And I'm going to finish with Papa, I think. Um, just a couple of reasons to be cheerful for us all. When we, as we go on the move, Al, I'm gonna start with you, the cheerful man at the end. You can set the tone. <laughs> um, Africa's abundant renewable energy mm. that, it, that it is rapidly uh, tapping and its people, their talents, their entrepreneurship, their dreams. It's like nowhere else on earth. Yeah. Rui, I'm going to go to you now. You know, uh, the majority of the, the African population is young people, mm. full of strength. They are willing, they want to get the continent moving forward. What we need is to educate these people. Educate them, give them the tools, and we're gonna get there. I think we've got everything to succeed. The continent is there. We've got resources, young people, and just to educate them. Educate them, give them the tools, yeah, yeah. and we're going to make yeah, it. From Charlie Robertson earlier. Yeah. Very good, thanks. Sir Rafa, for you. Yes, uh, uh, Africa uh, has a huge population, and uh, that in itself is a big market. 
uh, given our uh, GDP, which is uh, over 13 trillion, the, 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 the potentials are great. But we strongly believe that uh, investors will even have uh, a good return on investment. As of today, I still believe that Nigeria is a country where you have the highest rate of return on your investment. Thank you. Thank you. Very, and Papa, the final word well, for, the, I, for the leader of the House. I would say, I would say uh, that Africa is on the move. This is a century. And in terms of advantage, the UK has an advantage over all other countries when it comes to relationships with Africa. It is important that UK leverages on that. I mean, can you imagine? And, and the greatest asset of Africa is its human resource. And you have it located also in the UK. You have uh, Ghanaian uh, or UK, Ghani, British Ghanaians, British Nigerians, huge pool. And it is important that the United Kingdom takes advantage of this. Mm. Of course, I, I, I dare say that uh, the UK is now gradually rediscovering itself. And I, 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 I say this <laughs> to some of my, my friends in uh, the, in the British bureaucracy that, you know, the UK is just now like a, 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 a young child, you know, which is peeping through the window. <laughs> Daring to go outside, but hesitant. But now that you have Brexit, this is the time for the United Kingdom to partner with Africa. I dare say that uh, in terms of the private sector, the UK is helping with export, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, uh, supporting uh, UK companies who are moving into Africa. It is the private sector. And I, sometimes I say this, and I don't know whether it's politically correct, you know. The UK spirit that enabled it at one time to control about one third of the globe, you need to rediscover that spirit to get that benefit, which Africa is going to be. Otherwise, the Chinese will take over and you weep. <laughs> but we believe that Africa's first preference in terms of its development is with the United Kingdom. So let's work together. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everybody on the panel. That was its partnership, its trade not aid, it's using the private sector, it's getting on with it and working together and I completely agree with Sir Afra, it's about personal relationships and building those. So let's carry on doing that as we discuss things and thank you to everybody. I'm sorry Abner we went over a little bit but mm. it's probably my last Did one we? so who cares. <laughs> um, what are we doing now? We now have a break in which you can discuss all these oh, things. Yeah. You can't have questions because <laughs> there's no questions allowed. You can ask questions afterwards because no, no. Abner tells me, and Abner's an Ashanti Andrew, woman, Andrew, and you don't do. You don't mind a few questions. What? <laughs> does anybody mind having? Okay, we'll have some. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. Uh, two. Just one. Bring the tea in. Bring the coffee here. <laughs> <laughs> it's all joining. One question at the front here. And another one at the back. And another one at the back. Just keep going. Oh, and these are important oh, guys. <laughs> Maybe. I'm Shout. My question is to Pat. Uh, you talked about the investment into Africa of close to $5 billion. Uh, what, and you said that most of it is in renewables. Uh, why don't you help Africa, instead of exporting biscuits and jam and things to Africa? And I pay a pound for a packet of biscuits here. <coughs> when I go to Accra, I pay for the same packet of biscuits, two pounds. Mm. Or, or a make them bar of chocolate, <laughs> or, or ice cream. You know, Magnum almonds in Morrison's is three pounds. I paid eight pounds in Accra. Why don't you help them set up manufacturing facilities in Africa? Yeah. 
So um, I think, yeah, okay. Well, let's have one. We'll have one more question to go. Let's have all the questions now, and we can answer them because I think that's a nice one to answer. Because exactly, most of the big companies we're working with do all their stuff in Africa anyway. So yeah, for example. Am I, am I waiting for more questions? Or? Yeah, we'll just have. Well, I want come to on. Just note it. Just can we have your question? Yes, yeah, certainly. My name is Stephen Williams. Um, <clears throat> um, I've been watching Africa for a number of years. And I'm really excited about the uh, free trade area agreement. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, but of course, the proof is in the pudding. And uh, as I understand it, there's still a vital step to go, and that is on rules of origin, uh, 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 the rules of origin question. I wonder if you could give me some, in, give us some indication of where Africa is at at the moment and how much you, you consider the uh, rules of origin question to be a possible stumbling block. I don't want to be negative, but I think it's important to recognize what the challenges are. And as we have two members from Comesa, a supplementary question would be, will the AFC TFA, uh, will it encourage a faster adoption of the ECHO uh, common currency within your regional economic community? Okay. <laughs> one more, last one, unless their excellencies decide otherwise, I think. <laughs> Good afternoon, and Andrew, great uh, day today. Thank you so much. Uh, Steve Cameron previously ran a shipping line to West Africa for 20 years, and I've been a trustee of the Africa Centre for nearly as long. Um, Which has just reopened. Uh, the, the, uh, I've got a client in Ghana who has opened a manufacturing facility for uh, pharmaceuticals. He can't trade to the rest of, not even within ECOWAS at, at the moment, for, partly because of the the structure's not there to enable the cross-border, but also the physical structure's not there in terms of transport yet, but that will come if the car goes there. I thought the trademark initiative worked really well in East Africa, it was involved. So, so the big bang theory of the Africa free trade zone, trying to do everything for every, all of Africa all at once, is, is a big ask. We can't even trade within our island at the moment. So maybe as part of the solution, so that, so that industry can invest in manufacturing and trade, we should just look at starting with some easy, uh, the, 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 the high density trade corridors as, and, and roll it out on that basis. Okay. Al, do you want to pick up the first, because I know you've been looking at some of the technicalities a lot in terms of origin, and then anybody else who wants to answer any of those questions, please jump in. So the, the, the first or the second question? The second question I'd, I'd prefer to take away than try and attempt an answer in the room, but I'd, re I'd committed to, to try and get you a full answer on that, sir. The, the first question, two points, I think. First is we, we are providing quite a, quite a lot of support to manufacturing in Africa. We have a dedicated program called Manufacturing Africa, um, and that's both um, primary stage manufacturing, uh, value adding, and connection to global uh, value chains. Um, the, the, the point I'd make is that it, uh, I'd better not name the company, but one of our large companies makes toothpaste in Ghana, actually, and says that that is the most efficient toothpaste factory they have in the entire world. And in theory, then, the price of the product should be the least in the entire world. But by the time it's passed a number of borders in Africa, the additional cost of the facilitation across those borders means that it ends up reaching consumers as the most expensive toothpaste in the world. So I think it just underlines the argument for the, the work the AFCFTA is doing and this trade facilitation, that, that the, the cost is not necessarily the manufactured cost, it's the cost of getting it from point of manufacture to point of consumer. Um, I th it's just a really interesting example that brings it yeah, home. Yeah. Does anybody else want to, Sarafa, do you want to answer any of those questions? No? no? Well, I, I, I think... Uh, in terms of uh, border controls, uh, I consider it's a problem. But despite all these things, you know, you find African countries collaborating together. I mean, 
For instance, in terms of cocoa production, Ghana and Ivory Coast have set up this joint marketing that enables them to put up a, a floor price for uh, farmers. And even for manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, for as I know Ghana is quite, quite strong when it comes to pharmaceuticals. And of course, we have been having problems with our big brother, you know, when it comes to export. <laughs> it had to come in there. And even, and, even, and even when it comes to uh, drinks, you know, spirits and so forth. Mm. But those who have persevered are able to export to Nigeria. So gradually working on it, I mean, we have a common currency, echo. We don't seem to be making much progress. But I believe that progress has been made incrementally in, in very, very, very small, small steps. Mm. But uh, yes, so. I well, I'm still really positive. Right. And what I'm really positive about is that we have to bring our tea in here to drink it. No, what are we doing? We go out, come back at 3.45 for the Mozambican session. But once again, thank you so much to everybody. Um, apologies to Abner, but you know. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.